Section 21 of Popular Tales from the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Veron Real. Popular Tales from the North by Sir George Rapdesant. Section 21. The Cock and the Hen. In this tale, the notes of the cock and hen must be imitated. Hen. You promise me shoes year after year, year after year, and yet I get no shoes. Cock. You shall have them, never fear, henny penny. Hen. I lay egg after egg, egg after egg, and yet I go about barefoot. Cock. Well, take your eggs and be off to the tryst, and buy yourself shoes, and don't go any longer barefoot. End of section 21. Two of Popular Tales from the Norse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Clarica. Popular Tales from the Norse by Sir George Webb Dasent. Section 22 How One Went Out to Woo. Once on a time, there was a lad who went out to woo him a wife. Amongst other places he came to a farmhouse, where the household were little better than beggars. But when the wooer came in, they wanted to make out that they were well-to-do, as you may guess. Now the husband had got a new arm to his coat. "'Pray take a seat,' he said to the wooer, "'but there's a shocking dust in the house.' So he went about rubbing and wiping all the benches and tables with his new arm, but he kept the other all the while behind his back. The wife, she had got one new shoe, and she went stamping and sliding with it up against the stools and chairs, saying, How untidy it is here! Everything is out of its place! Then they called out to their daughter to come down and put things to rights, but the daughter, she had got a new cap. So she put her head in at the door and kept nodding and nodding, first to this side and then to that. "'Well, for my part,' she said, "'I can't be everywhere at once.' "'Ay, ay, that was a well-to-do household the wooer had come to.'" End of section 22 23 of Popular Tales from the North This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Didier. Popular Tales from the North by Sir George Webb Descent. Section 23. The Master Smith. Once on a time, in the days when our Lord and St. Peter used to wander on earth, they came to a smith's house. He had made a bargain with the devil that the fiend should have him after seven years, but during that time he was to be the master of all masters in his trade, and to this bargain both he and the devil had signed their names. So he had stuck up in great letters over the door of his forge, Here dwells the master over all masters. Now, when our Lord passed by and saw that, he went in. Who are you? he said to the smith. Read what's written over the door, said the smith, but maybe you can't read writing. If so, you must wait till someone comes to help you. Before our Lord had time to answer him, a man came with his horse, which he begged the smith to shoe. Might I have leave to shoe it? asked our Lord. You may try if you like, said the smith. You can do it so badly that I shall not be able to make it right again. So our Lord went out and took one leg off the horse and laid it in the furnace 
and made the shoe red hot. After that, he turned up the ends of the shoe and filed down the heads of the nails and clenched the points. And then he put back the leg safe and sound on the horse again. And when he was done with that leg, he took the other foreleg and did the same with it. And when he was done with that, he took the hind legs, first the off and then the near leg, and laid them in the furnace, making the shoes red hot, turning up the ends, filing the heads of the nails, and clenching the points. And after all was done, putting the legs on the horse again. All the while, the smith stood by and looked on. You're not so bad a smith after all, said he. Oh, you think so, do you? said our Lord. A little while after came the smith's mother to the forge and called him to come home and eat his dinner. She was an old old woman with an ugly crook on her back and wrinkles in her face, and it was as much as she could do to crawl along. Mark now what you see said our Lord. Then he took the woman and laid her in the furnace and smithed a lovely young maiden out of her. Well, said the smith, I said now, as I said before, you are not such a bad smith after all. There it stands over my door. Here dwells the master over all all masters. But for all that, I say right out, one learns as long as one lives. And with that, he walked off to his house and ate his dinner. So after dinner, just after he had got back to his forge, a man came riding up to have his horse shod. It shall be down in the twinkling of an eye, said the smith, for I have just learned a new way to shoe, and a very good way it is when the days are short. So he began to cut and hack till he had got all the horse's legs off, for he said, I don't know why one should go puttering backwards and forwards, first with one leg and then with another. Then he laid the legs in the furnace, just as he had seen our Lord lay them, and threw on a great heap of coal, and made his mates work the bellows bravely. But it went as one might suppose it would go. The legs were burned to ashes, and the smith had to pay for the horse. Well, he didn't care much about that, but just then an old beggar woman came along the road, and he thought to himself, Better luck next time. So he took the old dame and laid her in the furnace, and though she begged and prayed hard for life, it was no good. You're so old, you don't know what is good for you, said the smith. Now you shall be a lovely young maiden in half no time, and for all that I'll not charge you a penny for the job. But it went no better with a poor old woman than with a horse's legs. That was ill done, and I say it said our lord. Oh, for that matter, said the smith, there's not many will ask after her, I'll be bound. But it's a shame of the devil if this is the way he holds to what is written up over the door. If you might have three wishes from me, said our lord, what would you wish for? Only try me, said the smith, and you'll soon know. 
so our lord gave him three wishes well said the smith first and foremost i wish that anyone whom i ask to climb up into the pear tree that stands outside by the wall of my forge may stay sitting there till i ask him to come down again the second wish i wish is that any one whom i ask to sit down in my easy chair which stands inside the workshop yonder may stay sitting there till i ask him to get up last of all i wish that any one whom i ask to creep into the steel purse which i have in my pocket may stay in it till i give him leave to creep out again you have wished as a wicked man said saint peter first and foremost you should have wished for god's grace and good will i durstn't look so high as that said the smith and after that our lord and saint peter bade him good-bye and went on their way well the years went on and on and when the time was up the devil came to fetch the smith as it was written in the bargain are you ready he said as he stuck his nose in at the door of the forge oh said the smith i must just hammer the head of this tenpenny nail first meantime you can just climb up into the pear tree and pluck yourself a pear to gnaw at you must be both hungry and thirsty after your journey so the devil thanked him for his kind offer and climbed up into the pear tree very good said the smith but now on thinking the matter over i found i shall never be able to have done hammering the head of this snail till four years are out at least this iron is so pleggy hard down you can come in all that time but may sit up there and rest your bones when the devil heard this he begged and prayed till his voice was as thin as a silver penny that he might have lived to come down but there was no help for it there he was and there he must stay at last he had to give his word of honour not to come again till the four years were out which the smith has spoken of and then the smith said very well now you may come down so when the time was up the devil came again to fetch the smith you're ready now of course said he you've had time enough to hammer the head of that nail i should think yes the head is right enough now said the smith but still you have come a little tiny bit too soon for i haven't quite done sharpening the point such pleggy hard iron i never hammered in all my born days so while i work at the point you may just as well sit down in my easy chair and rest yourself i'll be bound you're weary after coming so far thank you kindly said the devil and down he plumped into the easy chair but just as he had made himself comfortable the smith said on second thoughts he found he couldn't get the point sharp till four years were out first of all the devil begged so prettily to be let out of the chair and afterwards waxing wrath he began to threaten and scold but the smith kept on all the while excusing himself and saying it was all the iron's fault it was so pleggy hard and telling the devil he was not so badly off to have to sit quietly in an easy chair and that he would let him out 
to the minute when the four years were over. Well, at least there was no help for it, and the devil had to give his word of honor not to fetch the smith till the four years were out. And then the smith said, Well, now you may get up and be off about your business. And away went the devil as fast as he could lay legs to the ground. When the four years were over, the devil came again to fetch the smith, and he called out as he stuck his nose in at the door of the forge. Now I know you must be ready. Ready, aye, ready, answered the smith. We can go now as soon as you please. But hark here, there is one thing I have stood here and thought and thought. I would ask you to tell me, is it true what people say, that the devil can make himself as small as he pleases? God knows it's the very truth, said the devil. Oh, said the smith, it is true, is it? Then I wish you would just be so good as to creep into this steel purse of mine and see whether it is sound at the bottom, for to tell you the truth, I'm afraid my travelling money will drop out. With all my heart, said the devil, who made himself small in a trice and crept into the purse. But he was scarce in when the smith snapped to the clasp. Yes, called out the devil inside the purse. It's right and tight everywhere. Very good, said the smith. I'm glad to hear you say so. But more haste the worse speed, says the old soul. And forewarned is forearmed, says another. So I'll just weld these links a little together, just for safety's sake. And with that, he laid the purse in the furnace and made it red hot. Oh, oh, screamed the devil. Are you mad? Don't you know I'm inside the purse? Yes, I do, said the smith. But I can't help you, for another old soul says, one must strike while the iron is hot. And as he said this, he took up his sledgehammer, laid the purse on the anvil, and let fly at it as hard as he could. Ow, 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 bellowed the devil inside the purse. Dear friend, do let me out, and I'll never come near you again. Very well, said the smith. Now, I think the links are pretty well welded, and you may come out. So he unclasped the purse, and away went the devil in such a hurry that he didn't once look behind him. Now, some time after, it came across the smith's mind that he had done a silly thing in making the devil his enemy, for he said to himself, If, as is like enough, they won't have me in the kingdom of heaven, I shall be in danger of being houseless, since I have fallen out with him who rules over hell. So he made up his mind it would be best to try to get either into hell or heaven, and to try at once rather than to put it off any longer, so that he might know how things really stood. Then he threw his sledgehammer over his shoulder and set off. When he had gone a good bit of the way, he came to a place where two roads met and where the path to the kingdom of heaven parts from the path that leads to hell, and here he overtook a tailor who was pelting along with his goose in his hand. Good day, said the smith. Whither are you off to? To the kingdom of heaven, said the tailor. If I can only get into it, but whither are you going yourself? Oh, our ways don't run together, said the smith, for I have made up my mind to try first in hell, as the devil and I know something of one another, 
from old times. So they bade one another good-bye, and each went his way. But the smith was a stout, strong man, and got over the ground far faster than the tailor, and so it wasn't long before he stood at the gates of hell. Then he called the watch, and bade him go and tell the devil there was someone outside who wished to speak a word with him. Go out, said the devil to the watch, and ask him who he is. So that when the watch came and told him that, the smith answered, Go and greet the devil in my name, and say it is the smith who owns the purse he wots of, and beg him prettily to let me in at once, for I worked at my forge till noon, and I have had a long walk since. But when the devil heard who it was, he charged the watch to go back and locked up all the nine locks of the gates of hell. And besides, he said, you may as well put on a padlock, for if he only once gets in, he'll turn hell tapsy-turvy. Well, said the smith to himself when he saw them busy bolting up the gates, there's no lodging to be got here, that's plain. So I may as well try my luck in the kingdom of heaven. And with that he turned round and went back till he reached the crossroads, and then he went along the path the teller had taken. And now, as he was cross at having gone backwards and forwards so far for no good, he strode along with all his might and reached the gate of heaven just as St. Peter was opening it a very little, just enough to let the half-starved teller slip in. The smith was still six or seven strides off the gate, so he thought to himself, Now there's no time to be lost, and grasping his sledgehammer, he hurled it into the opening of the door just as the tailor slunk in. And if the smith didn't get in then, when the door was ajar, well, I don't know what has become of him. End of section 2324 of Popular Tales from the Norse. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Solwyn. Popular Tales from the Norse by Sir George Webb Dawson. Section 24 The Two Stepsisters. Once on a time there was a couple, and each of them had a daughter by a former marriage. The woman's daughter was dull and lazy, and could never turn her hand to anything, and the man's daughter was brisk and ready, but somehow or other she could never do anything to her stepmother's liking, and both the woman and her daughter would have been glad to be rid of her. So it fell one day the two girls were to go out and spin by the side of the well, and the woman's daughter had flax to spin but the man's daughter got nothing to spin but bristles. "'I don't know how it is,' said the woman's daughter. "'You're always so quick and sharp, but still I'm not afraid to spin a match with you.' Well, they agreed that she whose thread first snapped should go down the well. So they span away, but just as they were hard at it, the man's daughter's thread broke, and she had to go down the well. But when she got to the bottom she saw far and wide around her a fair green mead, and she hadn't hurt herself at all. So she walked on a bit, till she came to a hedge which she had to cross. "'Ah, don't tread hard on me, pray don't, and I'll help you another time, that I will,' said the hedge. Then the lassie made herself as light as she could, and trod so carefully she scarce touched a twig. So she went a bit further, till she came to a brindled cow, which walked there with a milking pail on her horns. "'Twas a large, pretty cow, and her udder was so full and round. "'Ah, be so good as to milk me, pray,' said the cow. "'I am so full of milk. Drink as much as you please, and throw the rest over my hoofs, "'and see if I don't help you some day.' "'So 
So the man's daughter did as the cow begged. As soon as she touched the teats, the milk spouted out into the pail. Then she drank till her thirst was slaked, and the rest she threw over the cow's hoofs, and the milking pail she hung on her horns again. So when she had gone a bit further, a big weather met her, which had such thick long wool it hung down and draggled after him on the ground, and on one of his horns hung a great pair of shears. Ah, please clip off my wool, said the sheep, for here I go about with all this wool, and catch up everything I meet, and besides it's so warm I'm almost choked. Take as much of the fleece as you please, and twist the rest round my neck, and see if I don't help you some day. Yes, she was willing enough, and the sheep lay down of himself on her lap, and kept quite still, and she clipped him so neatly there wasn't a scratch on his skin. Then she took as much of the wool as she chose, and the rest she twisted round the neck of the sheep. A little further on she came to an apple tree, which was loaded with apples. All its branches were bowed to the ground, and leaning against the stem was a slender pole. "'Ah, do be so good as to pluck my apples off me,' said the tree, "'so that my branches may straighten themselves again, for it's bad work to stand so crooked. But when you beat them down, don't strike me too hard. Then eat as many as you please, lay the rest round my root, and see if I don't help you some day or other. Yes, she plucked all she could reach with her hands, and then she took the pole and knocked down the rest, and afterwards she ate her fill, and the rest she laid neatly round the root. So she walked on a long, long way, and then she came to a great farmhouse, where an old hag of the trolls lived with her daughter. There she turned in to ask if she could get a place. Oh, said the old hag, it's no use your trying. We've had ever so many maids, but none of them was worth her salt. But she begged so prettily that they would just take her on trial, that at last they let her stay. So the old hag gave her a sieve, and bade her go and fetch water in it. She thought it strange to fetch water in a sieve, but still she went, and when she came to the well, the little birds began to sing. Daub in clay, stuff in straw, daub in clay, stuff in straw. Yes, she did so, and found she could carry water in a sieve well enough. But when she got home with the water, and the old witch saw the sieve, she cried out, This you haven't sucked out of your own breast. So the old witch said, Now she might go into the byre to pitch out dung and milk kind. But when she got there, she found a pitchfork so long and heavy, she couldn't stir it, much less work with it. She didn't know at all what to do, or what to make of it, but the little bird sang again that she should take the broomstick and toss out a little with that, and all the rest of the dung would fly after it. So she did that, and as soon as ever she began with the broomstick, the byre was as clean as if it had been swept and washed. Now she had to milk the kine, but they were so restless that they kicked and frisked. There was no getting near them to milk them. But the little birds sang outside, a little drop, a tiny sup, for the little birds to drink it up. Yes, she did that. She milked a tiny drop. T'was as much as she could for the little birds outside. And then all the cows stood still and let her milk them. They neither kicked nor frisked. They didn't even lift a leg. So when the old witch saw her coming in with the milk, she cried out, This you haven't sucked out of your own breast. But now just take this black wool and wash it white. This the lassie was at her wit's end to know how to do for she had never seen or heard of any one who could wash black wool white. Still she said nothing, but took the wool and went down with it to the well. There the little birds sang again, and told her to take the wool and dip it into the great butt that stood there, and she did so, and out it came as white as snow. "'Well, I never,' said the old witch, when she came in with the wool. "'It's no good keeping you. You can do everything, and at last you'll be the plague of my life.' We'd best part, so take your wages and be off. Then the old hag drew out three caskets, one red, one green, and one blue, and of these the lassie was to choose one as wages for her service. Now she didn't know at all which to choose, but the little bird sang, Don't take the red, don't take the green, but take the blue, where may be seen. Three little crosses, all in a row, we saw the marks, and so we know. So she took the blue casket as the birds sang. "'Bad luck to you, then,' said the old witch. "'See if I don't make you pay for this.' So when the man's daughter was just setting off, the old witch shot a red-hot bar of iron after her, but she sprang behind the door and hid herself, 
so that it missed her, for her friends, the little birds, had told her beforehand how to behave. Then she walked on and on as fast as ever she could, but when she got to the apple tree, she heard an awful clatter behind her on the road, and that was the old witch and her daughter coming after her. So the lassie was so frightened and scared, she didn't know what to do. "'Come hither to me, lassie, do you hear?' said the apple tree. "'I'll help you. Get under my branches and hide, for if they catch you, they'll tear you to death and take the casket from you.' Yes, she did so, and she had hardly hidden herself before up came the old witch and her daughter. "'Have you seen any lassie pass this way, you apple tree?' said the old hag. "'Yes, yes,' said the apple tree. "'One ran by here an hour ago, but now she's got so far ahead you'll never catch her up.' So the old witch turned back and went home again. Then the lassie walked on a bit, but when she came just about where the sheep was, she heard an awful clatter beginning on the road behind her, and she didn't know what to do, she was so scared and frightened, for she knew well enough it was the old witch, who had thought better of it. "'Come hither to me, lassie,' said the weather, "'and I'll help you. Hide yourself under my fleece, and then they'll not see you, else they'll take away the casket and tear you to death.' Just then up came the old witch, tearing along. "'Have you seen any lassie pass here, you sheep?' she cried to the weather. "'Oh, yes,' said the weather. "'I saw one an hour ago.' but she ran so fast you'll never catch her. So the old witch turned round and went home. But when the lassie had come to where she met the cow, she heard another awful clatter behind her. Come hither to me, lassie, said the cow, and I'll help you to hide yourself under my udder, else the old hag will come and take away your casket and tear you to death. True enough, it wasn't long before she came up. Have you seen any lassie pass here, you cow? said the old hag. "'Yes, I saw one an hour ago,' said the cow. "'But she's far away now, for she ran so fast I don't think you'll ever catch her up.' So the old hag turned round and went back home again. When the lassie had walked a long, long way farther on, and was not far from the hedge, she heard again that awful clatter on the road behind her, and she got scared and frightened, for she knew well enough it was the old hag and her daughter who had changed their minds. "'Come hither to me, lassie,' said the hedge, "'and I'll help you. "'Creep under my twigs, so that they can't see you, "'else they'll take the casket from you "'and tear you to death.' "'Yes, she made all the haste she could "'to get under the twigs of the hedge. "'Have you seen any lassie pass this way, you hedge?' "'said the old hag to the hedge. "'No, I haven't seen any lassie,' answered the hedge, "'and was as smooth-tongued as if he had got "'melted butter in his mouth. "'But all the while he spread himself out, and made himself so big and tall, no one had to think twice before crossing him. And so the old witch had no help for it but to turn round and go home again. So when the man's daughter got home, her stepmother and her stepsister were more spiteful against her than ever, for now she was much neater and so smart it was a joy to look at her. Still she couldn't get leave to live with them, but they drove her out into a pigsty. That was to be her house. So she scrubbed it out so neat and clean, and then she opened her casket, just to see what she had got for her wages. But as soon as ever she unlocked it, she saw inside so much gold and silver, and lovely things, which came streaming out till all the walls were hung with them, and at last the pigsty was far grander than the grandest king's palace. And when the stepmother and her daughter came to see this, they almost jumped out of their skin, and began to ask what kind of a place she had down there. "'Oh,' said the lassie, "'can't you see, when I have got such good wages? "'Twas such a family and such a mistress to serve, "'you couldn't find their like anywhere.' "'Yes, the woman's daughter made up her mind to go out to serve too, "'that she might get just such another gold casket. "'So they sat down to spin again, "'and now the woman's daughter was to spin bristles "'and the man's daughter flax, "'and she whose thread first snapped was to go down the well. "'It wasn't long, as you may fancy, "'before the woman's daughter's thread snapped.' and so they threw her down the well. So the same thing happened. She fell to the bottom, but met with no harm, and found herself on a lovely green meadow. When she had walked a bit, she came to the hedge. "'Don't tread hard on me, pray, lassie, and I'll help you again,' said the hedge. "'Oh,' said she, "'what should I care for a bundle of twigs?' And tramped and stamped over the hedge till it crackled and groaned again. A little further on she came to the cow, which walked about, ready to burst for want of milking. "'Be so good as to milk me, lassie,' said the cow, "'and I'll help you again. "'Drink as much as you please, but throw the rest over my hoofs.' 
yes she did that she milked the cow and drank till she could drink no more but when she left off there was none left to throw over the cow's hoofs and as for the pail she tossed it down the hill and walked on when she had gone a bit further she came to the sheep which walked along with his wool dragging after him oh be so good as to clip me lassie said the sheep and i'll serve you again take as much of the wool as you will but twist the rest round my neck well she did that but she went so carelessly to work that she cut great pieces out of the poor sheep and as for the wool she carried it all away with her a little while after she came to the apple tree which stood there quite crooked with fruit again be so good as to pluck the apples off me that my limbs may grow straight for it's weary work to stand all awry said the apple tree but please take care not to beat me too hard eat as many as you will but lay the rest neatly round my root and i'll help you again well she plucked those nearest to her and thrashed down those she couldn't reach with the pole but she didn't care how she did it and broke off and tore down great boughs and ate till she was as full as full could be and then she threw down the rest under the tree so when she had gone a good bit further she came to the farm where the old witch lived there she asked for a place but the old hag said she wouldn't have any more maids for they were either worth nothing or were too clever and cheated her out of her goods but the woman's daughter was not to be put off she would have a place so the old witch said she'd give her a trial if she was fit for anything the first thing she had to do was to fetch water in a sieve well off she went to the well and drew water in a sieve but as fast as she got it in it ran out again so the little birds sung daub in clay put in straw daub in clay put in straw but she didn't care to listen to the birds song and pelted them with clay till they flew off far away and so she had to go home with the empty sieve and got well scolded by the old witch then she was to go into the byre to clean it and milk the kine but she was too good for such dirty work she thought still she went out into the byre but when she got there she couldn't get on at all with the pitchfork it was so big the birds said the same to her as they had said to her stepsister, and told her to take the broomstick and toss out a little dung, and then all the rest would fly after it. But all she did with the broomstick was to throw it at the birds. When she came to milk, the kind were so unruly they kicked and pushed, and every time she got a little milk in the pail, over they kicked it. Then the birds sang again, A little drop and a tiny sup, for the little birds to drink it up. But she beat and banged the cows about and threw and pelted at the birds everything she could lay hold of and made such a to-do twas awful to see so she didn't make much either of her pitching or milking and when she came indoors she got blows as well as hard words from the old witch who sent her off to wash the black wool white but that too she did no better then the old witch thought this really too bad so she set out the three caskets one red one green and one blue and said she'd no longer any need of her services, for she wasn't worth keeping, but for wages she should have leave to choose whichever casket she pleased. Then sung the little birds, Don't take the red, don't take the green, but choose the blue, where may be seen three little crosses all in a row. We saw the marks, and so we know. She didn't care a pin for what the birds sang, but took the red, which caught her eye most. And so she set out on her road home, and she went along quietly and easily enough. There was no one who came after her. So when she got home, her mother was ready to jump with joy, and the two went at once into the ingle and put the casket up there, for they made up their minds there could be nothing in it but pure silver and gold, and they thought to have all the walls and roof gilded like the pigsty. But lo, when they opened the casket there came tumbling out nothing but toads and frogs and snakes, and worse than that, whenever the woman's daughter opened her mouth, out popped a toad or a snake, and all the vermin one ever thought of, so that at last there was no living in the house with her. That was all the wages she got for going out to service with the old witch. End of section 24《of popular tales from the nurse》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Selina Mendoza. Popular Tales from the Nurse by Sir George Webb Dawson. Section 25. Buttercup. Once on a time, there was an old wife who sat and baked. Now you must know that this old wife had a little son who was a plump and fat, 
and so fond of good things that they called him Buttercup. She had a dog too, whose name was Goldtooth, and as she was baking, all at once Goldtooth began to bark. Run now, Buttercup, Jersey dear, said the old wife, and see what Goldtooth is barking at. So the boy ran out and came back crying out, Oh, heaven help us! Here comes a great big witch with her head under her arm and a bag at her back. Jump under the knitting trough and hide yourself, said his mother. So in came the old hag. Good day, said she. God bless you, said Buttercup's mother. Isn't your Buttercup at home today? asked the hag. Not that he isn't, he's out in the wood with his father shooting term again. Plague take it, said the hag. For I had such a nice little silver knife I wanted to give him. Pip pip, here I am, said Buttercup under the knitting chuff and out he came. I'm so old and stiff in the bag, said the hag. You must creep into the bag and fetch it out for yourself. But when Buttercup was well into the bag, the hag threw it over her back and strode off. And when they had gone a good bit of the way, the old hag got tired and asked, How far is it off to snoring? Half a mile, answered Buttercup. So the hag put down the sack on the road and went aside by herself into the wood and lay down to sleep. Meantime, Buttercup set to work and cut a hole in the sack with his knife. Then he crept out and put a great root of a fir tree into the sack and ran home to his mother. When the hag got home and saw what there was in the sack, you may fancy she was in a fine rage. Next day, the old wife sat and begged again and her dog began to bark just as he did the day before. Run now, buttercup, my boy, said she, and see what Goldtooth is barking at. Well, I never, cried buttercup as soon as he got out. If there isn't that ugly old beast coming again with her head under her arm and a great sack at her back, under the knitting chop with you and hide, said his mother. Good day, said the hag. Is your buttercup at home today? I'm sorry to say he isn't, said his mother. He's out in the wood with his father shooting charm again. What a bar, said the hag. Here I have a beautiful little silver spoon I want to give him. Pip pip, here I am, said Buttercup and crept out. I'm so stiff in the bag, said the old witch. You must crept into the sack and fetch it out for yourself. So when Buttercup was well into the sack, the hag swung it over her shoulders and set off home as fast as her legs could carry her. But when they had gone a good bit, she grew weary and asked, How far is it off to snoring? A mile and a half, answered Buttercup. So the hag set down the sack and went aside into the wood to sleep a bit, but while she slept, Buttercup made a hole in the sack and got out and put a great stone into it. Now, when the old witch got home, she made a great fire on the hearth and put a big pot on it, and got everything ready to boil Buttercup, but when she took the sack and thought she was going to turn out Buttercup into the pot, down plumped the stone and made a hole into the bottom of the pot, so that the water ran out and quenched the fire. Then the old hag was in a dreadful rage and said, if he makes himself ever so happy next time, he shan't take me in again. The third day everything went just as it had gone twice before. Goldtooth began to bark and Buttercup's mother said to him, Do run out and see what our duck is barking at. So out he went, but he soon came back crying out. Heaven save us, here comes the old hag again with her head under her arm and a sack at her back. Jump under the knitting trough and hide, said his mother. Good day, said the hag as she came in at the door. Is your buttercup at home today? You're very kind to ask after him, said his mother. But he's out in the wood with his father shooting term again. What a bore now, said the old hag. Here have I got such a beautiful little silver fork for him. Beep beep, here I am, said buttercup as he came out from under the knitting trough. I'm so stiff in the back, said the hag. You must creep into the sack and fetch it out for yourself. But when Buttercup was well inside the sack, the old hag swung it across her shoulders and set off as fast as she could. This time she did not turn aside to slip by the way, but went straight home with Buttercup in the sack 
and when she reached her house, it was Sunday. So the old hag said to her daughter, "Now you must take Buttercup and kill him and boil him nicely till I come back, for I'm off to church to bid my guests to dinner." So when all in the house were gone to church, the daughter was to take Buttercup and kill him, but then she didn't know how to set about it at all. Stop a bit," said Buttercup. "I'll soon show you how to do it. Just lay your head on the chopping block, and you'll soon see." So the poor silly thing laid her head down, and Buttercup took an axe and chopped her head off, just as if she had been a chicken. Then he laid her head in the bed and popped her body into the pot, and boiled it so nicely. And when he had done that, he climbed out on the roof and dragged up with him the fir tree root. And the stone, and put the one over the door and the other at the top of the chimney. So when the household came back from church and saw the head on the bed, they thought it was the daughter who lay there asleep, and then they thought they would just taste the broth. Good by my troth, better cup broth," said the old hag. "Good by my troth, better broth," said better cup down the chimney, but no one heeded him. So the old hag's husband, who was every bit as bad as she, took the spoon to have a taste. "Good by my troth, better cup broth," said he. "Good by my troth, better broth," said better cup down the chimney pipe. Then they all began to wonder who it could be that chattered so, and ran out to see. But when they came out at the door, better cup. Threw down on them the fir tree root and the stone, and broke all their heads to bits. After that, he took all the gold and silver that lay in the house and went home to his mother and became a rich man. End of section twenty-five. Twenty-six of popular tales from the north. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Selden. Popular Tales from the North by Sir George Webb Dasent. Section twenty-six. Taming the Shrew. Once on a time, there was a king, and he had a daughter. Who was such a scold, and whose tongue went so fast there was no stopping it. So he gave out that the man who could stop her tongue should have the princess to wife, and half his kingdom into the bargain. Now, three brothers who heard this made up their minds to go and try their luck. And first of all, the two elder went, for they thought they were the cleverest, but. They couldn't cope with her at all, and got well thrashed besides. Then Boots, the youngest, set off, and when he had gone a little way, he found an osier band lying on the road, and he picked it up. When he had gone a little farther, he found a piece of a broken plate, and he picked that up too. A little further on, he found a dead magpie, and. A little further on, still a crooked ram's horn. So he went on a bit and found the fellow to the horn. And at last, just as he was crossing the fields by the king's palace, where they were pitching out dung, he found a worn-out shoe sole. All these things he took with him into the palace, and went before the princess. Good day," said he. "Good day," said she, and made. A wry face. Can I get my magpie cooked here? He asked. I'm afraid it will burst," answered the princess. Oh, never fear, for I'll just tie this osier band round it," said the lad, as he pulled it out. The fat will run out of it," said the princess. Then I'll hold this under it," said the lad, and showed her the piece of broken plate. You are so crooked in your words," said the princess. There is no knowing where to have you. No, I'm not crooked," said the lad. "But this is," as he held up one of the horns. "Well," said the princess, 
I never saw the match of this in all my days. Why, here you see the match to it, said the lad, as he pulled out the other ram's horn. I think, said the princess, you must have come here to wear out my tongue with your nonsense. No, I have not, said the lad, but this is worn out, as he pulled out the shoe sole. To this, the princess hadn't a word to say, for she had fairly lost her voice with rage. Now you are mine, said the lad, and so he got the princess to wife and half the kingdom. End of section 26「once on a time there was a poor couple who lived in a tumble-down hut in which there was nothing but black want so that they hadn't a morsel to eat nor a stick to burn but though they had next to nothing of other things they had god's blessings in the way of children and every year they had another babe now when this story begins they were just looking out for a new child and to tell the truth the husband was rather cross and he was always going about grumbling and growling and saying for his part he thought one might have too many of these god's gifts so when the time came that the babe was to be born he went off to the wood to fetch fuel saying he didn't care to stop and see the young squalor he'd be sure to hear him soon enough screaming for food now when her husband was well out of the house his wife gave birth to a beautiful boy, who began to look about the room as soon as ever he came into the world. "'Oh, dear mother,' he said, "'give me some of my brother's cast-off clothes and a few days' food, and I will go out into the world and try my luck. You have enough children as it is, that I can see.' "'God help you, my son,' answered his mother. "'That can never be. You are far too young yet.' But the tiny one stuck to what he said, and begged and prayed until his mother was forced to let him have a few old rags, and a little food tied up in a bundle, and off he went right merrily and manfully into the wide world. But he was scarce out of the house before his mother had another boy, and he too looked about him and said, "'Oh, dear mother, give me some of my brother's old clothes and a few days' food, and I'll go out into the world to find my twin brother.' You have enough children already on your hands, that I can see. God help you, my poor little fellow, said his mother. You are far too little. This will never do. But it was no good. The tiny one begged and prayed so hard till he got some tattered rags and a bundle of food, and so he wandered out into the world like a man to find his twin brother. Now when the younger had walked a while, he saw his brother a good bit on before him, so he called out to him to stop. "'Hello! Can't you stop? Why, you lay legs to the ground as if you were running a race. But you might just as well have stayed to see your youngest brother before you set off in the world in such a hurry.' So the elder stopped and looked around. And when the younger had come up to him and told him the whole story, and how he was his brother, he went on to say, "'Well, let's sit down here and see what our mother has given us for food.' So they sat down together, and were soon great friends. Now when they had gone a bit farther on their way, they came to a brook which ran through a green meadow, and the youngest said now the time was come to give one another names. Since we set off in such a hurry that we hadn't time to do it at home, we may as well do it here. Well, said the elder, and what shall your name be? Oh, said the younger, my name shall be Shortshanks, and yours, what shall it be? 
I will be called King Sturdy, answered the eldest. So they christened each other in the brook and went on. But when they had walked a while they came to a crossroad and agreed they should part there and each take his own road. So they parted, but they hadn't gone half a mile before their roads met again. So they parted the second time and took each a road. But in a little while the same thing happened and they met again. They scarce knew how. And the same thing happened a third time also. Then they agreed that they should each choose a quarter of the heavens, and one was to go east and the other west. But before they parted, the elder said, If you ever fall into misfortune or need, call three times on me, and I will come and help you. But mind, you don't call on me till you are at the last pinch. Well, said Shortshanks, if that's to be the rule, I don't think we shall meet again very soon. After that they bade each other good-bye, and Shortshanks went east, and King Sturdy went west. Now you must know, when Shortshanks had gone a good bit alone, he met an old, old, crook-backed hag who only had one eye, and Shortshanks snapped it up. Oh, oh, screamed the hag, what has become of my eye? "'What will you give me?' asked Shortshanks, "'if you get your eye back.' "'I'll give you a sword, and such a sword! "'It will put a whole army to flight, be it ever so great,' answered the old woman. "'Out with it, then,' said Shortshanks. "'So the old hag gave him the sword and got her eye back again. "'After that, Shortshanks wandered on a while,' and another old, old, crook-backed hag met him, who had only one eye, which Shortshanks stole before she was aware of him. "'Oh, oh, whatever has become of my eye?' screamed the hag. "'What will you give me to get your eye back?' asked Shortshanks. "'I'll give you a ship,' said the woman, "'which can sail over fresh water and salt water and over high hills and deep dales.' "'Well, out with it,' said Shortshanks.' So the old woman gave him a little tiny ship, no bigger than he could put in his pocket, and she got her eye back again, and they each went their own way. But when he had wandered on a long, long way, he met a third time an old, old, crook-backed hag with only one eye. This eye, too, Shortshank stole. And when the hag screamed and made a great to-do, bawling out what had become of her eye, Shortshanks said, What will you give me to get back your eye? Then she answered, I will give you the art how to brew a hundred lasts of malt at one strike. Well, for teaching that art, the old hag got back her eye, and they each went their way. But when Shortshanks had walked a little way, he thought it might be worth while to try his ship. So he took it out of his pocket, and put first one foot into it, and then the other. And as soon as ever he set one foot into it, it began to grow bigger and bigger, and by the time he set the other foot into it, it was as big as other ships that sail on the sea. Then Shortshanks said, off and away, over fresh water and salt water, over high hills and deep dales, and don't stop till you come to the king's palace. And lo, away went the ship, as swiftly as a bird through the air, till it came down a little below the king's palace, and there it stopped. From the palace windows, people had stood and seen Shortshanks come sailing along, and they were all so amazed that they ran down to see who it could be that came sailing in a ship through the air. But while they were running down, Shortshanks had stepped out of his ship and put it into his pocket again, for as soon as he stepped out of it, it became as small as it was when he got it from the old woman. So those who had run down from the palace saw no one but a ragged little boy standing down there by the strand. Then the king asked whence he came, but the boy said he didn't know, nor could he tell them how he got there. 
there he was and that was all they could get out of him but he begged and prayed so prettily to get a place in the king's palace saying if there was nothing else for him to do he could carry in wood and water for the kitchen maid that their hearts were touched and he got leave to stay there now when shortshanks came up to the palace he saw how it was all hung with black both outside and in wall and roof so he asked the kitchen maid what all that mourning meant don't you know said the kitchen maid i'll soon tell you the king's daughter was promised away a long time ago to three ogres and next thursday evening one of them is coming to fetch her ritter red it is true has given out that he is man enough to set her free but god knows if he can do it and now you know why we are all in grief and sorrow so when thursday evening came ritter red led the princess down to the strand for there it was she was to meet the ogre and he was to stay by her there and watch but he wasn't likely to do the ogre much harm i reckon for as soon as ever the princess had sat down on the strand ritter red climbed up into a great tree that stood there and hid himself as well as he could among the boughs the princess begged and prayed him not to leave her but ritter red turned a deaf ear to her and all he said was tis better for one to lose life than for two that was what ritter red said meantime short shanks went to the kitchen maid and asked her so prettily if he might go down to the strand for a bit and what should you take down to the strand asked the kitchen maid you know you've no business there oh dear friend said short shanks do let me go i should so like to run down there and play a while with the other children that i should well well said the kitchen maid off with you but don't let me catch you staying there a bit over the time when the brose for supper must be set on the fire and the roast put on the spit and let me see when you come back mind you bring a good armful of wood with you yes short shanks would mind all that so off he ran down to the strand but just when he reached the spot where the princess sat what should come but the ogre tearing along in his ship so that the wind roared and howled after him he was so tall and stout it was awful to look on him and he had five heads of his own fire and flame screamed the ogre fire and flame yourself said the short shanks can you fight roared the ogre if i can't i can learn said short shanks so the ogre struck at him with a great thick iron club which he had in his fist and the earth and stones flew up five yards into the air after the stroke my said shortshanks that was something like a blow but now you shall see a stroke of mine then he grasped the sword he had got from the old crook-backed hag and cut at the ogre and away went all his five heads flying over the sand so when the princess saw she was saved she was so glad that she scarce knew what to do and she jumped and danced for joy come lie down and sleep a little in my lap she said to short shanks and as he slept she threw over him a tinsel robe now you must know it wasn't long before ritter red crept down from the tree as soon as he saw there was nothing to fear in the way and he went up to the princess and threatened her until she promised to say it was he who had saved her life for if she wouldn't say so he said he would kill her on the spot after that he cut out the ogre's lungs and tongue and wrapped them up in his handkerchief and so led the princess back to the palace and whatever honors he had not before he got then for the king did not know how to find honor enough for him and made him sit every day on his right hand at dinner as for shortshanks he went first of all on board the ogre's ship and took a whole heap of gold and silver rings as large as hoops and trotted off with them as hard as he could go to the palace when the kitchen maid set her eyes on all that gold and silver she was quite scared and asked him 
but dear good shortshanks wherever did you get all this from for she was rather afraid he hadn't come rightly by it oh answered shortshanks i went home for a bit and there i found these hoops which had fallen off some old pails of ours so i laid hands on them for you if you must know well when the kitchen-maid heard they were for her she said nothing more about the matter but thanked shortshanks and they were good friends again the next thursday evening it was the same story over again all were in grief and trouble but ridder red said as he had saved the princess from one ogre it was hard if he couldn't save her from another and down he led her to the strand as brave as a lion but he didn't do this ogre much harm either for when the time came that they looked for the ogre he said as he had said before tis better one should lose life than two and crept up into his tree again but shortshanks begged the kitchen-maid to let him go down to the strand for a little oh asked the kitchen-maid and what business have you down there dear friend said shortshanks do pray let me go i long so to run down and play a while with the other children well the kitchen-maid gave him leave to go but he must promise to be back by the time the roast was turned and he was to mind and bring a big bundle of wood with him so shortshanks had scarce got down to the strand when the ogre came tearing along in his ship so that the wind howled and roared round him he was twice as big as the other ogre and he had ten heads on his shoulders fire and flame screamed the ogre fire and flame yourself answered shortshanks can you fight roared the ogre if i can't i can learn said shortshanks then the ogre struck at him with his iron club it was even bigger than that which the first ogre had and the earth and stones flew up ten yards into the air my said shortshanks that was something like a blow now you shall see a stroke of mine then he grasped his sword and cut off all the ogre's ten heads at one blow and sent them dancing away over the sand then the princess again said to him lie down and sleep a little while on my lap and while shortshanks lay there she threw over him a silver robe but as soon as ridder red marked that there was no more danger in the way he crept down from the tree and threatened the princess till she was forced to give her word to say it was he who had set her free after that he cut the lungs and tongue out of the ogre and wrapped them in his handkerchief and led the princess back to the palace then you may fancy what mirth and joy there was and the king was at his wit's end to know how to show ridder red honor and favor enough this time too shortshanks took a whole armful of gold and silver rings from the ogre's ship and when he came back to the palace the kitchen maid clapped her hands in wonder asking wherever he got all that gold and silver from but shortshanks answered that he had been home a while and that the hoops had fallen off some old pails so he had laid his hands on them for his friend the kitchen-maid so when the third thursday evening came everything happened as it had happened twice before the whole palace was hung with black and all went about mourning and weeping but ridder red said he couldn't see what need they had to be so afraid he had freed the princess from two ogres and he could very well free her from a third so he led her down to the strand but when the time drew near for the ogre to come up he crept into his tree again and hid himself the princess begged and prayed but it was no good for ridder red said again tis better that one should lose life than two that evening too shortshanks begged for leave to go down to the strand oh said the kitchen-maid what should take you down there but he begged and prayed so that at last he got leave to go only he had to promise to be back to the kitchen again when the roast was to be turned so off he went but he had scarce reached the strand when the ogre came with the wind howling and roaring after him he was much much bigger than either of the other two and he had fifteen heads on his shoulders 
Fire and flame, roared out the ogre. Fire and flame yourself, said Shortshanks. Can you fight? screamed the ogre. If I can't, I can learn, said Shortshanks. I'll soon teach you, screamed the ogre, and struck at him with his iron club, so that the earth and stones flew up fifteen yards into the air. My, said Shortshanks, that was something like a blow, but now you shall see a stroke of mine. As he said that, he grasped his sword, and cut off all the ogre's fifteen heads at one blow, and sent them all dancing over the sand. So the princess was freed from all the ogres, and she both blessed and thanked Shortshanks for saving her life. Sleep now a while on my lap, she said, and he laid his head on her lap, and while he slept, she threw over him a golden robe. But how will we let it be known that it is you that have saved me? she asked when he awoke. Oh, I'll soon tell you, answered Shortshanks. When Ritter Red has led you home again, and given himself out as the man who has saved you, you know he is to have you to a wife, and half the kingdom. Now, when they ask you, on your wedding day, whom you will have to be your cup-bearer, you must say, I will have the ragged boy who does odd jobs in the kitchen, and carries in wood and water for the kitchen-maid. So, when I am filling your cups, I will spill a drop on his plate, but none on yours. Then he will be wroth, and give me a blow, and the same thing will happen three times. But the third time you must mind and say, Shame on you to strike my heart's darling. He it is who set me free, and him will I have. After that, Shortshanks ran back to the palace as he had done before, but first he went on board the ogre's ship and took a whole heap of gold and silver and precious stones, and out of them he gave the kitchen maid another great armful of gold and silver rings. Well, as for Ritter Red, as soon as ever he saw that all risk was over, he crept down from his tree and threatened the princess till she was forced to promise she would say it was he who had saved her. After that he led her back to the palace, and all the honor shown him before was nothing to what he got now, for the king thought of nothing else than how he might best honor the man who had saved his daughter from the three ogres. As for his marrying her and having half the kingdom, that was a settled thing, the king said. But when the wedding day came, the princess begged she might have the ragged boy who carried in wood and water for the cook to be her cup-bearer at the bridal feast. I can't think why you would want to bring that filthy beggar boy in here, said Ritter Red. But the princess had a will of her own, and said she would have him and no one else to pour out her wine. So she had her way at last. Now everything went as it had been agreed between Shortshanks and the princess. He spilled a drop on Ritter Red's plate, but none on hers. And each time Ritter Red got wroth and struck him. At the first blow, Shortshanks' rags fell off which he had worn in the kitchen. At the second, the tinsel robe fell off, and at the third, the silver robe, and then he stood in his golden robe, all gleaming and glittering in the light. Then the princess said, Shame on you to strike my heart's darling. He has saved me, and him will I have. Ritter Red cursed and swore it was he who had set her free. But the king put in his word and said, The man who saved my daughter must have some token to show for it. Yes, Ritter Red had something to show, and he ran off at once after his handkerchief with the lungs and tongues in it, and Shortshanks fetched all the gold and silver and precious things he had taken out of the ogre's ships. So each laid his tokens before the king, and the king said, the man who has such precious stores of gold and silver and diamonds must have slain the ogre and spoiled his goods, for such things are not to be had elsewhere. 
So Ritter Red was thrown into a pit full of snakes, and Shortshanks was to have the princess and half the kingdom. One day Shortshanks and the king were out walking, and Shortshanks asked the king if he hadn't any more children. Yes, said the king, I have another daughter. But the ogre has taken her away, because there was no one who could save her. Now you are going to have one daughter, but if you can set the other free, whom the ogre has carried off, you shall have her too, with all my heart and the other half of my kingdom. Well, said Shortshanks, I may as well try, but I must have an iron cable, five hundred fathoms long, and five hundred men, and food for them to last fifteen weeks, for I have a long voyage before me. Yes, said the king, he should have them, but he was afraid there wasn't a ship in his kingdom big enough to carry such a freight. Oh, if that's all, said Shortshanks, I have a ship of my own. With that, he whipped out of his pocket the ship he had got from the old hag. The king laughed and thought it was all a joke, but Shortshanks begged him only to give him what he had asked, and he should soon see if it was a joke. So they got together what he wanted, and Shortshanks bade him put the cable on board the ship first of all. But there was no one man who could lift it, and there wasn't room for more than one at a time around the tiny ship. Then Shortshanks took hold of the cable by one end and laid a link or two into the ship. And as he threw in the links, the ship grew bigger and bigger, till at last it got so big that there was room enough and to spare in it for the cable and the five hundred men and their food and Shortshanks and all. Then he said to the ship, Off and away, over fresh water and salt water, over high hill and deep dale, and don't stop till you come to where the king's daughter is. And away went the ship over land and sea, till the wind whistled after it. So when they had sailed far, far away, the ship stood stock still in the middle of the sea. Ah, said Shortshanks, now we have got so far, but how we are to get back is another story. Then he took the cable and tied one end of it round his waist and said, Now I must go to the bottom. But when I give the cable a good tug and want to come up again, mind you all hoist away with a will, or your lives will be lost as well as mine. And with these words overboard he leapt and dived down, so that the yellow waves rose around him in an eddy. Well, he sank and sank, and at last he came to the bottom, and there he saw a great rock rising up with a door in it, so he opened the door and went in. When he got inside, he saw another princess who sat and sewed, but when she saw Shortshanks, she clasped her hands together and cried out, Now God be thanked, you are the first Christian man I've set eyes on since I came here. Very good, said Shortshanks, but do you know I've come to fetch you? Oh, she cried, you'll never fetch me, you'll never have that luck, for if the ogre sees you, he'll kill you on the spot. I'm glad you spoke of the ogre, said Shortshanks. "'Twould be fine fun to see him. Whereabouts is he?' Then the princess told him that the ogre was out looking for someone who could brew a hundred lasts of malt at one strike, for he was going to give a great feast, and less drink would not do. "'Well, I can do that,' said Shortshanks. "'Ah,' said the princess, "'if only the ogre wasn't so hasty, I might tell him about you.' but he's so cross I'm afraid he'll tear you to pieces as soon as he comes in without waiting to hear my story. Let me see what is to be done. Oh, I have it. Just hide yourself in the side room yonder and let us take our chance. Well, Shortshanks did as she told him, and he had scarce crept into the side room before the ogre came in. Huff, said the ogre, what a horrid smell of Christian man's blood. Yes, said the princess, I know there is. 
for a bird flew over the house with a christian man's bone in his bill and let it fall down the chimney i made all the haste i could to get it out again but i dare say it's that you smell oh said the ogre like enough then the princess asked the ogre if he had laid hold of any one who could brew a hundred lasts of malt at one strike no said the ogre i can't hear of any one who can do it well she said a while ago there was a chap in here who said he could do it just like you with your wisdom said the ogre why did you let him go away when you knew he was the very man i wanted well then i didn't let him go said the princess but father's temper is a little hot so i hid him away in the side room yonder but if father hasn't hit upon any one here he is well said the ogre let him come in then so shortshanks came in and the ogre asked him if it were true that he could brew a hundred lasts of malt at one strike yes it is said shortshanks twas good luck then to lay hands on you said the ogre and now fall to work this minute but heaven help you if you don't brew the ale strong enough oh said shortshanks never fear it shall be stinging stuff and with that he began to brew without more fuss but all at once he cried out i must have more of you ogres to help in the brewing for these i have aren't half strong enough well he got more so many that there was a whole swarm of them and then the brewing went on bravely now when the sweet wort was ready they were all eager to taste it you may guess first of all the ogre and then all his kith and kin but shortshanks had brewed the wart so strong that they all fell down dead one after another like so many flies as soon as they had tasted it at last there wasn't any one of them left alive but one vile old hag who lay bedridden in the chimney corner oh you poor old wretch said shortshanks you may just as well taste the wart along with the rest so he went and scooped up a little from the bottom of the copper in the scoop and gave her a drink and so he was rid of the whole pack of them as he stood there and looked about him he cast his eye on a great chest so he took it and filled it with gold and silver then he tied the cable round himself and the princess and the chest and gave it a good tug and his men pulled them all up safe and sound as soon as ever shortshanks was well up he said to the ship off and away over fresh water and salt water high hill and deep dale and don't stop till you come to the king's palace and straight away the ship held on her course so that the yellow billows foamed around her when the people in the palace saw the ship sailing up they were not slow in meeting them with songs and music welcoming shortshanks with great joy but the gladdest of all was the king who had now got his other daughter back again but now shortshanks was rather downhearted for you must know that both the princesses wanted to have him and he would have no other than the one he had saved first and she was the youngest so he walked up and down and thought and thought what he should do to get her and yet do something to please her sister well one day as he was turning the thing over in his mind it struck him if he only had his brother king sturdy who was so like him that no one could tell the one from the other he would give up to him the other princess and half the kingdom for he thought one half was quite enough well as soon as ever this came into his mind he went outside the palace and called on king sturdy but no one came so he called a second time a little louder but still no one came then he called out the third time king sturdy with all his might and there stood his brother before him didn't i say he said to shortshanks didn't i say you were not to call me except in your utmost need and here there is not so much as a gnat to do you any harm and with that he gave him such a box on the ear that shortshanks tumbled head over heels on the grass 
"'Now shame on you to hit so hard,' said Shortshanks. First of all, I won a princess and half the kingdom. And then I won another princess and the other half of the kingdom, and now I'm thinking to give you one of the princesses and half the kingdom. Is there any rhyme or reason in giving me such a box on the ear?' When King Sturdy heard that, he begged his brother to forgive him, and they were soon as good friends as ever again. Now, said Shortshanks, you know we are so much alike that no one can tell one from the other. So, just change clothes with me and go into the palace. Then the princesses will think it is I that am coming in, and the one that kisses you first you shall have for your wife, and I will have the other for mine." And he said this because he knew well enough that the elder king's daughter was the stronger, and so he could very well guess how things would go. As for King Sturdy, he was willing enough, so he changed clothes with his brother and went into the palace. But when he came into the princess's bower, they thought it was Shortshanks, and both ran up to him to kiss him but the elder who was stronger and bigger pushed her sister on one side and threw her arms around king sturdy's neck and gave him a kiss and so he got her for his wife and shortshanks got the younger princess then they made ready for the wedding and you may fancy what a grand one it was when i tell you that the fame of it was noised abroad over seven kingdoms End of section 27、Section、28、of、Popular、Tales from the Norse。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 28 Goodbrand on the Hillside Once on a time there was a man whose name was Gudbrand. He had a farm, which lay far, far away upon a hillside, and so they called him Gudbrand on the Hillside. Now, you must know this man and his good wife lived so happily together and understood one another so well that all the husband did the wife thought so well done there was nothing like it in the world, and she was always glad whatever he turned his hand to. The farm was their own land. And they had a hundred dollars lying at the bottom of their chest, and two cows tethered up in a stall in their farmyard. So one day his wife said to Gudbrand, Do you know, dear, I think we ought to take one of our cows into town and sell it. That's what I think, for then we shall have some money in hand, and such well to do people as we ought to have ready money like the rest of the world. As for the hundred dollars in the bottom of the chest yonder, we can make a hole in them. And I'm sure I don't know what we want with more than one cow. Besides, we shall gain a little in another way, for then I shall get off with only looking after one cow, instead of having, as now, to feed and litter and water too. Well, Gudbrand thought his wife talked right good sense, so he set off at once with the cow on his way to town to sell her. But when he got to the town, there was no one who would buy his cow. Well, well, never mind, said Gudbrand. At worst, I can only go back home again with my cow. I've got both stable and tether for her, I should think, and the road is no farther out than in. And with that, he began to toddle home with his cow. But when he had gone a bit of the way, a man met him who had a horse to sell. So, Gudbrun thought 'twas better to have a horse than a cow, so he swapped with the man. A little farther on, he met a man walking along and driving a fat pig before him, and he thought it better to have a fat pig than a horse. So he swapped with the man. After that, he went a little farther, and a man met him with a goat. So he thought it better to have a goat than a pig, and he swapped with the man who owned the goat. Then he went on a good bit till he met a man who had a sheep, and he swapped with him too, for he thought it always better to have a sheep than a goat. After a while, he met a man with a goose, and he swapped away the sheep for the goose. And when he had walked a long, long time, He met a man with a cock, and he swapped with him, for he thought in this wise, "'Tis surely better to have a cock than a goose!' Then 
He went on till the day was far spent, and he began to get very hungry. So he sold the cock for a shilling, and bought food with the money, for, thought Goodbrand on the hillside, "'Tis always better to save one's life than to have a cock!' After that he went on home till he reached his nearest neighbor's house, where he turned in. "'Well,' said the owner of the house, "'how did things go with you in town?' "'Rather so-so,' said Goodbrand. "'I can't praise my luck, nor do I blame it either.' And with that he told the whole story from first to last. "'Ah,' said his friend, "'you'll get nicely called over the coals. "'That one can see. "'When you get home to your wife, heaven help you, "'I wouldn't stand in your shoes for something.' "'Well,' said Goodbrand on the hillside, "'I think things might have gone much worse with me. "'But now, whether I've done wrong or not, "'I have such a kind good wife. "'She never has a word to say against anything that I do.' "'Oh,' answered his neighbor, "'I hear what you say, but I don't believe it for all that.' "'Shall we lay a bed upon it?' asked Goodbrand on the hillside. "'I have a hundred dollars at the bottom of my chest at home. "'Will you lay as many against them?' "'Yes, the friend was ready to bet, "'so Goodbrand stayed there till evening when it began to get dark, "'and then they went together to his house, "'and the neighbor was to stand outside the door and listen "'while the man went in to see his wife. "'Good evening,' said Goodbrand on the hillside. "'Good evening,' said the good wife. "'Oh, is that you? Now God be praised.' "'Yes, it was he. "'So the wife asked how things had gone with him in town. "'Oh, only so-so,' answered Goodbrand. "'Not much to brag of. "'When I got to the town, there was no one who would buy the cow. "'So you must know I swapped it away for a horse.' "'For a horse,' said his wife. "'Well, that is good of you. "'Thanks with all my heart. "'We are so well to do "'that we may drive to church just as well as other people. "'And if we choose to keep a horse, "'we have a right to get one, I should think. "'Run out, child, and put up the horse.' "'Ah,' uh, said Goodbrand, "'but you see, I've not got the horse after all, "'for when I got a bit farther on the road, "'I swapped it away for a pig.' "'Think of that now,' said the wife. "'You did just as I should have done myself a thousand thanks. "'Now I can have a bit of bacon in the house to set before people when they come to see me that I can.' "'What do we want with a horse? "'People would only say we had got so proud that we couldn't walk to church. "'Go out, child, and put the pig in the sty.' "'But I've not got the pig either,' said Goodbrand. "'For when I got a little farther on, I swapped it away for a milch goat.' "'Bless us!' cried his wife. "'How well you manage everything! "'Now I think it over. "'What should I do with a pig? "'People would only point at us and say, "'Yonder they ate up all they have got. "'No, now I have got the goat, "'and I shall have milk and cheese and keep the goat too. "'Run out, child, and put up the goat.' "'Nay, but I haven't got the goat either,' said Goodbrand. "'For a little farther on I swapped it away "'and got a fine sheep instead.' "'He don't say so,' cried his wife. "'Why, you do everything to please me, just as if I had been with you. "'What do we want with a goat? "'If I had it, I should lose half my time climbing up the hills to get it down. "'No, if I have a sheep, I shall have both wool and clothing and fresh meat in the house. "'Run out, child, and put up the sheep.' "'But I haven't got the sheep any more than the rest,' said Goodbrand. "'For when I had gone a bit farther, I swapped it away for a goose.' "'Thank you, thank you, with all my heart,' cried his wife. "'What should I do with a sheep? "'I have no spinning wheel, no carding comb, "'nor should I care to worry myself with cutting and shaping and sewing clothes. "'We can buy clothes as we have always done. "'And now I shall have a roast goose, which I have longed for so often, "'and, besides, down to stuff my pillow with. "'Run out, child, and put up the goose.' "'Ah!' said Goodbrand. "'But I haven't the goose either, for when I had gone a bit farther, I swapped it away for a cock.' "'Dear me!' cried his wife. "'How you think of everything! Just as I should have done myself, a cock! Think of that! Why, it's as good as an eight-day clock! For every morning the cock crows at four o'clock, and we shall be able to stir our stumps in good time. What should we do with a goose? I don't know how to cook it. And as for my pillow, we can stuff it with cotton grass. Run out, child, and put up the cock. 
But, after all, I haven't got the cock, said Goodfriend. For when I had gone a bit farther, I was as hungry as a hunter, so I was forced to sell the cock for a shilling, for fear I should starve. Now God be praised that you did so, cried his wife. Whatever you do, you do it always just after my own heart. What should we do with the cock? We are our own masters, I should think, and can lie abed in the morning as long as we like. Heaven be thanked that I have got you safe and back again, you who do everything so well that I want neither cock nor goose, neither pig nor kine. Then Goodbrand opened the door and said, Well, what do you say now? Have I won the hundred dollars? And his good neighbor was forced to allow that he had. End of section 28「Of Popular Tales from the Norse」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by John Newman. « Popular Tales from the Norse » by Sir George Webb de Saint. Section 29. The Blue Belt Once on a time there was an old beggar woman who had gone out to beg. She had a little lad with her, and when she had got her bag full, she struck across the hills toward her own home. So when they had gone a bit up the hillside, they came upon a little blue belt, which lay where two paths met, and the lad asked his mother's leave to pick it up. No, said she, maybe there's witchcraft in it. And so with threats, she forced him to follow her. But when they had gone a bit further, the lad said he must turn aside a moment out of the road, and meanwhile his mother sat down on a tree stump. But the lad was a long time gone, for as soon as he got so far into the wood that the old dame could not see him, he ran off to where the belt lay, took it up, tied it round his waist, and lo, he felt as strong as if he could lift the whole hill. When he got back, the old dame was in a great rage, and wanted to know what he had been doing all that while. "'You don't care how much time you waste, and yet you know the night is drawing on, and we must cross the hill before it gets dark.' So on they tramped. But when they had gone about halfway, the old dame grew weary, and said she must rest under a bush. "'Dear mother,' said the lad, "'mayn't I just go up to the top of this high crag while you rest, and try if I can't see some sign of folk hereabouts?' Yes, he might do that. So, when he had got to the top, he saw a light shining from the north. So he ran down and told his mother, "'We must get on, mother. We are near a house, for I see a bright light shining quite close to us in the north.' Then she rose and shouldered her bag, and set off to sea. But they hadn't gone far before there stood a steep spur of the hill right across their path. "'Just as I thought,' said the old dame. "'Now we can't go a step farther. A pretty bed we shall have here.' But the lad took the bag under one arm, and his mother under the other, and ran straight up the steep crag with them. "'Now don't you see? Don't you see that we are close to a house? Don't you see the bright light?' But the old dame said those were no Christian folk, but trolls, for she was at home in all that forest far and near, and knew there was not a living soul in it until you were well over the ridge and had come down on the other side. But they went on, and in a little while they came to a great house which was all painted red. "'What's the good?' said the old dame. "'We daren't go in, for here the trolls live.' "'Don't say so. We must go in. There must be men where the lights shine so,' said the lad. So in he went, and his mother after him. But he had scarce opened the door before she swooned away, for there she saw a great stout man, at least twenty feet high, sitting on the bench. "'Good evening, grandfather,' said the lad. "'Well, I have sat here three hundred years,' said the man who sat on the bench. "'And no one has ever come and called me grandfather before.' Then the lad sat down by the man's side, and began to talk to him as if they had been old friends. "'But what's come over your mother?' said the man after they had chatted a while. "'I think she swooned away. You had better look after her.' So the lad went and took hold of the old dame, and dragged her up the hall along the floor. That brought her to herself, and she kicked and scratched, and flung herself about, and at last sat down upon a heap of firewood in the corner. But she was so frightened that she scarce dared to look one in the face. After a while, the lad asked if they could spend the night there. "'Yes, to be sure,' said the man. So they went on talking again, but the lad soon got hungry and wanted to know if they could get food as well as lodging. "'Of course,' said the man. 
that might be got too. And after he had sat a while longer, he rose up and threw six loads of dry pitch pine on the fire. This made the old hag still more afraid. Oh, now he's going to roast us alive, she said in the corner where she sat. And when the wood had burned down to glowing embers, up got the man and strode out of his house. Heaven bless and help us. What a stout heart you have got, said the old dame. Don't you see we have got amongst trolls? Stuff and nonsense, said the lad. No harm if we have. In a little while, back came the man with an ox so fat and big, the lad had never seen its like, and he gave it one blow with his fist under the ear, and down it fell dead on the floor. When that was done, he took it up by all the four legs, and laid it on the glowing embers, and turned it and twisted it about, till it was burnt brown outside. After that, he went to a cupboard, and took out a great silver dish, and laid the ox on it, and the dish was so big that none of the ox hung over on any side. This he put on the table, and then he went down into the cellar and fetched a cask of wine, knocked out the head, and put the cask on the table, together with two knives, which were each six feet long. When this was done, he bade them go and sit down to supper and eat. So they went, the lad first and the old dame after, but she began to whimper and wail, and to wonder how she should ever use such knives. But her son seized one, and began to cut slices out of the thigh of the ox, which he placed before his mother. And when they had eaten a bit, he took up the cask with both hands, and lifted it down to the floor. Then he told his mother to come and drink, but it was still so high she couldn't reach up to it. So he caught her up, and held her up to the edge of the cask, while she drank. As for himself, he clambered up and hung down like a cat inside the cask while he drank. So when he had quenched his thirst, he took up the cask, and put it back on the table, and thanked the man for the good meal, and told his mother to come and thank him too, and, afeard though she was, she dared do nothing else but thank the man. Then the lad sat down again, alongside the man, and began to gossip, and after they had sat a while, the man said, "'Well, I must just go and get a bit of supper too.' And so he went to the table, and ate up the whole ox, hooves and horns and all, and drained the cask to the last drop, and then went back and sat down on the bench. "'As for beds,' he said, "'I don't know what's to be done. I've only got one bed and a cradle, but we could get on pretty well if you would sleep in the cradle, and then your mother might lie in the bed yonder.' "'Thank you kindly. That'll do nicely,' said the lad. And with that he pulled off his clothes and lay down in the cradle. But, to tell you the truth, it was quite as big as a four-poster. As for the old dame, she had to follow the man who showed her to bed, though she was out of her wits for fear. Well, thought the lad to himself, "'twill never do to go to sleep yet. I'd best lie awake and listen how things go as the night wears on. So after a while the man began to talk to the old dame, and at last he said, "'We two might live here so happily together could we only be rid of this son of yours.' "'But do you know how to settle him? Is that what you're thinking of?' said she. "'Nothing easier,' said he. At any rate he would try. He would just say he wished the old dame would stay and keep house for him a day or two, and then he would take the lad out with him, up to the hill to quarry cornerstones, and roll down a great rock on him. All this the lad lay and listened to. Next day the troll— for it was a troll as clear as day, asked if the old dame would stay and keep house for him a few days. And as the day went on, he took a great iron crowbar, and asked the lad if he had a mind to go with him up the hill and quarry a few cornerstones. With all his heart, he said, and went with him. And so, after they had split a few stones, the troll wanted him to go down below and look after cracks in the rock. And while he was doing this, the troll worked away and wearied himself with his crowbar, till he moved a whole crag out of its bed which came rolling right down on the place where the lad was. But he held it up till he could get on one side and then let it roll down. Oh, said the lad to the troll. Now I see what you mean to do with me. You want to crush me to death. So just go down yourself and look after the cracks and refts in the rock, and I'll stand up above. The troll did not dare to do otherwise than the lad bade him, and the end of it was that the lad rolled down a great rock, which fell upon the troll, and broke one of his thighs. Well, you're in a sad plight, said the lad as he strode down, lifted up the rock, and set the man free. After that he had to put him on his back and carry him home. So he ran with him as fast as a horse, and shook him so that the troll screamed and screeched, as if a knife were run into him. And when he got home, he had to put the troll to bed, and there he lay in a sad pickle. "'Well,' said the old dame, "'if you can't hit on a plan to get rid of him, I'm sure I can't.' "'Let me see,' said the troll. 
I've got twelve lions in a garden. If they could only get hold of the lad, they'd soon tear him to pieces. So the old dame said it would be easy enough to get him there. She would sham sick, and say she felt so poorly nothing would do her any good but lion's milk. All that the lad lay and listened to, and when he got up in the morning, his mother said she was worse than she looked, and she thought she should never be right again unless she could get some lion's milk. Then I'm afraid you'll be poorly a long time, mother, said the lad, for I'm sure I don't know where any is to be got. Oh, if that be all, said the troll, there is no lack of lion's milk, if we only had the man to fetch it. And then he went on to say how his brother had a garden with twelve lions in it, and how the lad might have the key if he had a mind to milk the lions. So the lad took the key and a milking pail and strode off, and when he unlocked the gate and got into the garden, there stood all the twelve lions on their hind paws, rampant and roaring at him. But the lad laid hold of the biggest, and led him about by the forepaws, and dashed him against stocks and stones, till there wasn't a bit of him left but the two paws. So when the rest saw that, they were so afraid that they crept up and lay at his feet like so many curs. After that they followed him about wherever he went, and when he got home they lay down outside the house with their forepaws on the door sill. Now, mother, you'll soon be well, said the lad when he went in, for here's the lion's milk. He had just milked a drop in the pail. But the troll, as he lay in bed, swore it was all a lie. He was sure the lad was not the man to milk lions. When the lad heard that, he forced the troll to get out of bed, threw open the door, and all the lions rose up and seized the troll, and at last the lad had to make them leave their hold. That night the troll began to talk to the old dame again. I'm sure I can't tell you how to put this lad out of the way. He is so awfully strong. Can't you think of some way? No, said the old dame. If you can't tell, I'm sure I can't. Well, said the troll, I have two brothers in a castle. They are twelve times as strong as I am, and that's why I was turned out and had to put up with this farm. They hold that castle, and round it there is an orchard with apples in it, and whoever eats those apples sleeps for three days and three nights. If we could only get the lad to go for the fruit, he wouldn't be able to keep from tasting the apples, and as soon as ever he fell asleep my brothers would tear him in pieces. The old dame said she would sham sick, and say she could never be herself again unless she tasted those apples, for she had set her heart on them. All this the lad lay and listened to. When the morning came, the old dame was so poorly that she couldn't utter a word but groans and sighs. She was sure she should never be well again unless she had some of those apples that grew in the orchard near the castle where the man's brothers lived, only she had no one to send for them. Oh, the lad was ready to go that instant, but the eleven lions went with him, so when he came to the orchard, he climbed up into the apple tree and ate as many apples as he could, and he had scarce got down before he fell into a deep sleep. But the lions all lay round him in a ring. The third day came the troll's brothers, but they did not come in man's shape. They came snorting like man-eating steeds, and wondered who it was that dared to be there, and said they would tear him to pieces so small that there should not be a bit of him left. But up rose the lions, and tore the trolls into small pieces, so that the place looked as if a dung-heap had been tossed about it. And when they had finished the trolls, they lay down again. The lad did not wake till late in the afternoon, and when he got on his knees and rubbed the sleep out of his eyes, he began to wonder what had been going on when he saw the marks of the hooves. But when he went towards the castle, a maiden looked out of a window who had seen all that had happened, and she said, You may thank your stars you weren't in that tussle, else you must have lost your life. What? I lose my life, no fear of that, I think, said the lad. So she begged him to come in, that she might talk with him for she hadn't seen a Christian soul ever since she came there. But when she opened the door, the lions wanted to go in too, but she got so frightened that she began to scream, and so the lad let them lie outside. Then the two walked and talked, and the lad asked how it came that she, who was so lovely, could put up with those ugly trolls. She never wished it, she said. "'Twas quite against her will. They had seized her by force, and she was the king of Arabia's daughter. So they talked on, and at last... She asked him what he would do, whether she should go back home, or whether he would have her to wife. Of course he would have her, and she shouldn't go home. After that, they went round the castle, and at last they came to a great hall, where the troll's two great swords hung high up on the wall. 
"'I wonder if you are man enough to wield one of these?' said the princess. "'Who, I?' said the lad. "'Twould be a pretty thing if I couldn't wield one of these.' With that, he put two or three chairs, one atop of the other, jumped up and touched the biggest sword with his fingertips, tossed it up in the air, and caught it again by the hilt, leapt down, and at the same time dealt such a blow with it on the floor that the whole hall shook. After he had thus got down, he thrust the sword under his arm and carried it about with him. So, when they had lived a little while in the castle, the princess thought she ought to go home to her parents and let them know what had become of her. So they loaded a ship, and she set sail from the castle. After she had gone, and the lad had wandered about a little, he called to mind that he had been sent on an errand thither, and had come to fetch something for his mother's health. And though he said to himself, After all, the old dame was not so bad, but she's all right by this time, still he thought he ought to go and just see how she was. So he went and found both the man and his mother quite fresh and hearty. "'What wretches you are to live in this beggarly hut!' said the lad. "'Come with me up to my castle, and you shall see what a fine fellow I am.' Well, they were both ready to go, and on the way his mother talked to him and asked how it was he had got so strong. "'If you must know, it came of that blue belt which lay on the hillside that time when you and I were out begging,' said the lad. "'Have you got it still?' asked she. "'Yes, he had. It was tied round his waist. Might she see it?' "'Yes, she might.' and with that he pulled open his waistcoat and shirt to show it to her. Then she seized it with both hands, tore it off, and twisted it round her fist. Now, she cried, what shall I do with such a wretch as you? I'll just give you one blow and dash your brains out. Far too good a death for such a scamp, said the troll. No, let's first burn out his eyes and then turn him adrift in a little boat. So they burned out his eyes and turned him adrift, in spite of his prayers and tears. But, as the boat drifted, the lions swam after, and at last they laid hold of it and dragged it ashore on an island, and placed the lad under a fir tree. They caught game for him, and they plucked the birds and made him a bed of down, but he was forced to eat his meat raw, and he was blind. At last, one day the biggest lion was chasing a hare, which was blind, for it ran straight over stock and stone, and the end was it ran right up against a fir stump and tumbled head over heels across the field right into a spring. But lo, when it came out of the spring, it saw its way quite plain, and so saved its life. So, so, thought the lion, and went and dragged the lad to the spring and dipped him over head and ears into it. So, when he had got his sight again, he went down to the shore and made signs to the lions that they should all lie close together like a raft. Then he stood upon their backs while they swam with him to the mainland. When he had reached the shore, he went up into a birchen copse and made the lions lie quiet. Then he stole up to the castle like a thief to see if he couldn't lay hands on his belt, and when he got to the door, he peeped through the keyhole, and there he saw his belt hanging up over a door in the kitchen. So he crept softly in across the floor, but there was no one there. But as soon as he had got hold of the belt, he began to kick and stamp about as though he were mad. Just then, his mother came rushing out. "'Dear heart, my darling little boy, do give me the belt again,' she said. "'Thank you kindly,' said he. "'Now you shall have the doom you passed on me.' And he fulfilled it on the spot. When the troll heard that, he came in and begged and prayed so prettily that he might not be smitten to death. "'Well,' "'You may live,' said the lad, "'but you shall undergo the same punishment you gave me.' And so he burned out the troll's eyes and turned him adrift on the sea in a little boat, but he had no lions to follow him. Now the lad was all alone, and he went about longing and longing for the princess. At last he could bear it no longer. He must set out to seek her. His heart was so bent on having her. So he loaded four ships and set sail for Arabia. For some time they had fair wind and fine weather but after that they lay wind-bound under a rocky island. So the sailors went ashore and strolled about to spend the time. And there they found a huge egg, almost as big as a little house, so they began to knock it about with large stones, but after all they couldn't crack the shell. Then the lad came up with his sword to see what all the noise was about, and when he saw the egg he thought it a trifle to crack it. So he gave it one blow and the egg split, and out came a chicken as big as an elephant. "'Now we have done wrong,' said the lad. 
This can cost us all our lives. And then he asked his sailors if they were men enough to sail to Arabia in four and twenty hours if they got a fine breeze. Yes, they were good to do that, they said. So they set sail with a fine breeze and got to Arabia in three and twenty hours. As soon as they landed, the lad ordered all the sailors to go and bury themselves up to the eyes in a sand hill so that they could barely see the ships. The lad and the captains climbed a high crag and sat down under a fir. In a little while came a great bird flying with an island in its claws and let it fall down on the fleet and sunk every ship. After it had done that, it flew up to the sand hill and flapped its wings so that the wind nearly took off the heads of the sailors, and it flew past the fir with such force that it turned the lad right about. But he was ready with his sword and gave the bird one blow and brought it down dead. After that he went to the town, where every one was glad because the king had got his daughter back. But now the king had hidden her away somewhere himself, and promised her hand as a reward to any one who could find her, and this though she was betrothed before. Now as the lad went along, he met a man who had white bear skins for sale, so he bought one of the hides and put it on. And one of the captains was to take an iron chain and lead him about, and so he went into the town and began to play pranks. At last the news came to the king's ears that there never had been such fun in the town before, for here was a white bear that danced and cut capers just as it was bid. So a messenger came to say the bear must come to the castle at once, for the king wanted to see its tricks. So when it got to the castle, every one was afraid for such a beast they had never seen before. But the captain said there was no danger unless they laughed at it. They mustn't do that, else it would tear them to pieces. When the king heard that, he warned all the court not to laugh. But while the fun was going on, in came one of the king's maids and began to laugh and make game of the bear. And the bear flew at her and tore her, so that there was scarce a rag of her left. Then all the court began to bewail, and the captain most of all. Stuff and nonsense, said the king. She's only a maid. Besides, it's more my affair than yours. When the show was over, it was late at night. It's no good your going away when it's so late, said the king. The bear had best sleep here. Perhaps it might sleep in the ingle by the kitchen fire, said the captain. Nay,、nee, said the king. It shall sleep up here, and it shall have pillows and cushions to sleep on. So a whole heap of pillows and cushions was brought, and the captain had a bed in a side room. But at midnight the king came with a lamp in his hand and a big bunch of keys, and carried off the white bear. He passed along gallery after gallery through doors and rooms, up stairs and down stairs, till at last he came to a pier which ran out into the sea. Then the king began to pull and haul at posts and pins, this one up and that one down, till at last a little house floated up to the water's edge. There he kept his daughter, for she was so dear to him that he had hid her so that no one could find her out. He left the white bear outside while he went in and told her how it had danced and played its pranks. She said she was afraid and dared not look at it, but he talked her over, saying there was no danger if she only wouldn't laugh. So they brought the bear in and locked the door, and it danced and played its tricks. But just when the fun was at its height, the princess's maid began to laugh. Then the lad flew at her and tore her to bits, and the princess began to cry and sob. Stuff and nonsense! cried the king. All this fuss about a maid! I'll get you just as good a one again. But now I think the bear had best stay here till morning, for I don't care to have to go and lead it along all those galleries and stairs at this time of night. Well, said the princess, if it sleeps here, I'm sure I won't. But just then the bear curled himself up and lay down by the stove, and it was settled at last that the princess should sleep there too, with a light burning. But as soon as the king was well gone, The white bear came and begged her to undo his collar. The princess was so scared she almost swooned away, but she felt about till she found the collar, and she had scarce undone it before the bear pulled his head off. Then she knew him again and was so glad there was no end to her joy, and she wanted to tell her father at once that her deliverer was come. But the lad would not hear of it; he would earn her once more. He said so in the morning. When they heard the king rattling at the posts outside, the lad drew on the hide and lay down by the stove. Well, has it lain still? The king asked. I should think so," said the princess. "It hasn't so much as turned or stretched itself once." 
When they got up to the castle again, the captain took the bear and led it away, and then the lad threw off the hide and went to a tailor, and ordered clothes fit for a prince. And when they were fitted on, he went to the king, and said he wanted to find the princess. "'You're not the first who has wished the same thing,' said the king. "'But they have all lost their lives, for if any one who tries can't find her in four and twenty hours, his life is forfeited.' Yes, the lad knew all that. Still, he wished to try. And if he couldn't find her, t'was his lookout. Now, in the castle there was a band that played sweet tunes. And there were fair maids to dance with, and so the lad danced away. When twelve hours were gone, the king said, I pity you with all my heart. You're so poor hand at seeking, you will surely lose your life. Stuff, said the lad. While there's life, there's hope. So, as long as there's breath in the body, there's no fear. We have lots of time. And so he went on dancing till there was only one hour left. Then he said he would begin to search. It's no use now, said the king. Time's up. Light your lamp, out with your bunch of keys, said the lad, and follow me whither I wish to go. There's still a whole hour left. So the lad went the same way which the king had led him the night before, and he bade the king unlock door after door till they came down to the pier which ran out into the sea. "'It's all no use, I tell you,' said the king. "'Time's up, and this will only lead you right out into the sea.' "'Still five minutes more,' said the lad, as he pulled and pushed at the posts and pins, and the house floated up. "'Now the time is up,' bawled the king. "'Come hither, headsman, and take off his head.' "'Nay, nay,' said the lad, "'stop a bit. "'There are still three minutes. "'Out with the key, and let me get into this house.' "'But there stood the king and fumbled with his keys to draw out the time. "'At last he said he hadn't any key. "'Well, if you haven't, I have,' said the lad, "'and he gave the door such a kick "'that it flew to splinters inwards on the floor. "'At the door the princess met him "'and told her father this was her deliverer, "'on whom her heart was set.' So she had him, and this was how the beggar boy came to marry the king's daughter of Arabia. End of section 29、section、thirty of Popular Tales from the North. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Selvin. Popular Tales from the North by Sir George Webb Dassent. Section 30 Why the Bear is Stumpy Tailed. One day the bear met the fox who came slinking along with a string of fish he had stolen. Whence did you get those from? asked the bear. Oh, my lord Bruin, I've been out fishing and caught them, said the fox. So the bear had a mind to learn to fish too, and bade the fox to tell him how he was to set about it. Oh, it's an easy craft for you, answered the fox, and soon learned. You've only got to go upon the ice. And cut a hole and stick your tail down into it. And so you must go on holding it there as long as you can. You're not to mind if your tail smarts a little, that's when the fish bite. The longer you hold it there, the more fish you'll get. And then all at once, out with it, with the cross pull sideways and with the strong pull too. Yes, the bear did as the fox had said, and had held his tail a long, long time down in the hole till it was fast frozen in. Then he pulled it out with a cross pull, and it snapped short off. That's why Bruin goes about with a stumpy tail this very day. End of section 30